Namaste everyone, this is Pooja and welcome to part 2 of the master's program series that we are doing. This is basically uh, we, me and uh, Bansri talking about how if you are interested in applying to a master's program in Canada, specifically if you are a physiotherapist and you're interested in applying, this could be the potential uh, sort of pathway or timeline that you will be carrying forward or like this is this is something that you could consider and then add to your research and that should be the aim is that it, this should be helpful for you when you're applying for the program so once again once she is with us and she is going to she has pre prepared this beautiful ppt for us so she's going to guide us through that hi, <laughs> hi. Come with us and let's go see what you have to share okay first of all pardon me with the brightness issues but I hope we'll manage that. <laughs> okay, so I've tried my best to keep the PPT simple and five to six slides so that it's not very, you know, tedious for everyone to listen to. And I hope I'm not very tedious <laughs> too. Okay, let's start. So uh, I will, you will scroll through the slides when I say that? Yeah, I'll scroll through. Yeah, yeah okay. So first part I've created is, uh, created is how do I apply for the course? Uh, first thing to keep in mind is your basic requirement of the university like on you should prioritize your university based on the you know rank like my personal choice for prioritizing the university was uh, its ranking in terms of research as I was applying to a research-based course second um, uh, it's one of the most important criteria uh, your supervisor of the choice Second, uh, and third would be uh, the geographic location because being an international student, you also have to consider the financial aspect. So if you stay in a, you know, very well-developed city, uh, you, you might have extra expenses in that terms and you spend a lot. So yeah, geography plays an important role while deciding your university. So that's how I managed to prioritize the universities. Mm. And also, before we go through the other slides, I would just say that the whole process and the whole thing which I'm going to say is based on my university, that is the University of Western Ontario. And I've tried to keep the information as updated as possible. That is, it could be valid until December 2022, but things might change in future. And it's also different for uh, different universities, but the few, I would say it's a, a more of generalized and not so accurate as per every university so it's more of a generalized idea for everyone so first is how do i apply for the course what you do is go to the website go to a web page like the course you are applying for it and you can always download the pdf format of the application form just go through the form once and keep all the documents ready for yourself i would suggest that not to apply on the very same day just go through the form and the information they are asking uh, you um, usually they allow, make you to create an account like what you need to do is just sign up for their university web page and then you can again log in and log out again and access the application form so that's what I did I made an account for my university and then I just went through the application form and looked through it like what documents they were asking for it so that I kept it handy next time when I was actually applying for it and also made sure every information was accurate enough as per the identity document they were asking and stuff. And also one major thing to keep in mind while applying for the course is uh, the application deadline. It's always early for an international applicant than the Canadian ones. So yeah, application dates are to be verified before you apply for it. And uh, usually, like I applied for the fall term, so my application started almost a year before. So I started my application process in 2020, whereas I was actually applying for it in 2021. So it's a huge, long process uh, when you do it. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty much of it. All you need is the application form and that itself is your blueprint for everything going ahead. Like it mentions all the documents uh, in which format they are to be uploaded, what uh, size of that uh, PDF or what document or photograph it has to be. So I think that's pretty much precise and 
Yeah, the website usually has all the admission uh, admission requirements very succinct. They've they've mentioned it. So yeah, you're yeah. right. And always, most of the universities would have you create a, an account with them. And again, mm-hmm. there are no charges to create the account. So always yeah. do it. Only when you submit the form, that's when you actually pay the application fees. Till that point in time, there's no application fees. So you're right. Go through it. Go through everything, and that should that should be decent enough. Start. Uh, should I go on to the next one? So next, uh, I've uh, uh, prepared a slide on what are the requirements. So two basic requirements. First, being an international uh, applicant. I, uh, in your home country, you must have completed some kind of similar education to the course which you are like I'm apply, applying to health and rehab sciences. So it's pretty obvious that I should have some kind of background related to it. So for me, it was physiotherapy. For other students, uh, I have seen in the course as kinesiology or and it has to be an honors degree, meaning that it has to be a four years of um educate minimum four years of education which is required you cannot apply to it based on three years of education and i think that's mandatory and next is uh your academics it plays a very vital role here uh, so every university mentioned a certain amount of percentage on it so like for my university it was between 70 and 75 uh and i usually get a doubt from a uh, you know, juniors or students who ask me that I do not have this academic achievements, what, should I apply on it? I would still say go for it. Um, luckily, I had this, you know, I had the pretty uh, good average. Like, yeah. yeah, I was 73. So I was kind of in the middle. But yeah, I would always say that apply for it because it's not necessary that all the students who are applying for it are having this percentage or this academic achievements so you never know that plays a great role here so i would say that if you're uh you know confident and if you really want to be into the master's program just apply for it once um and one more thing that there's no need of any external agency to be hired while applying for it these are very simple forms uh, and every uh detail has been mentioned in pretty a precise manner that you don't need anyone else if you just go through the form just read the details and apply based on that you don't need any other person like being a student uh, yourself you can apply for it and you can fill the form very easily it's very accurate information given in the application form and yeah, it's not like that you need to do or you have to guess it out because this is this is a process for the students so it has to be yeah. easily understandable right so yeah exactly yeah, yeah. Like there's always a doubt amongst the student that uh, I'm not going through any agency or you know something like that. And uh, will I get the uh, admission? I would say yes, you'll get it because I did it myself. Yeah, and like my brother helped me to fill the form and stuff. But I, I didn't take any external help, I guess. So yeah, you can end up in a master's program. It's nothing like you need someone's help to yeah. apply for it. It's- it's just that when you don't have anyone who's already been through the process because you had someone who was close to you, it yeah. uh, you feel more confident. There are people who mm-hmm. like, oh, if I make one mistake and that is going to mm-hmm. sort of not let me, but anyone can make mistakes. So mm-hmm. sometimes you can use an agency just as a as, a, as someone to guide you. Uh, mm-hmm. But that's again, that's what I usually tell people. Do not rely 100% on them because this is your application. Process. You would be taking 100% interest. No one else would be doing it. So yeah. a really valid point. So yeah, we can we can carry on. So what else do we require here? Yeah. So in terms of documents, these documents are again as per the requirements of my university. And I would like to mention again, my university is University of Western Ontario and London, uh, province of Ontario. Um, so they require two academic letters of reference, a co- cover letter, a curriculum vitae or resume statement of research interest and uh, other are the language requir- requirements like being an you know uh, international applicant and english being our second language they always you know want to make sure that there would be a good communication so uh, it's just uh, one of the mandatory requirements to give the uh, language efficiency test and uh, they also accept like ielts toefl and duolingo and the requirements Again, very university to university. This requirements on the slide are based on the University of Western Ontario. And the above requirements, that is the reference letter or 
curl letter these are i think pretty uh, common in every university within canada uh, but yeah so for my university it was it was just two academic letter of references some might ask for three or even one um that might change but this is the usual process and this are one i would say all of them are the mandatory ones if and also statement of research interest it's particular to the research students only if you are applying for a course based program you don't need that yeah you might need yeah. a statement of purpose or something similar but statement yeah. of research would not be yeah but this is pretty standard like they'll require reference they'll re require a cover letter and stuff like that so yeah, yeah. okay yeah and uh just one important information if the university says that we want certain letter to be in certain amount of words or number of words like a statement of research has to be in 20, 250 words i would say just be precise enough a single letter extra or a single word extra might cause you some kind of issues because uh, it's usually a computerized process and they might reject uh, you know reading that part so if it says 250 it's always good to be less than more i would say here while applying for the course so yeah words make a huge difference yeah if anything is specifically mentioned that means they are looking for it so if yeah. there's no specification you can go on write down five pages that's fine but if there's a specification most probably there is a reason behind the specification so uh, this is mainly and uh, very particular for the research or thesis based students um i would say before filling the application forms one important thing you need to do is find your supervisor and supervisor again depends upon your university and most importantly your research uh interest because a certain student is uh, involved more into neurosciences and if they are applying or approaching a um a supervisor who is more into musculoskeletal you know it doesn't make any sense um and you even if you get the admission like you know let's just apply and you get the admission you yourself might not enjoy the process so it's very important uh, to look after your alignment and your supervisor's interest as well and it's very important like being a physio we have diverse field of interest like orthopedic surgery cardiopulmonary or antenatal postnatal very diverse fields of study and interest but fortunately <laughs> within canadian universities we have lots and lots of a uh, supervisor doing research on different uh, fields uh, even on measurements and methods so yeah research interest is very important and um, how to get one supervisor is you need to approach them through emails um and you might be lucky enough to get the reply within the first email or you will have to keep following up with them and again be strategic enough to drop an email on monday evening from india or your home country or something like that so that they might end up getting your first email here in the morning um and your email should uh, should be humble enough and then also be putting some amount of impact that you are really more into academic part and you really want to do some research and it's always good and useful when you go through their google scholar profiles or linkedin profiles so you get to know that what or research they already have done or what their research lab consists of what equipments they do have so based on that you can format your own personalized emails and you may also mention that i went through this research article of yours and it really you know resonated with me and i would exactly. want exactly yeah sure yeah. that and that shows that you're genuinely interested and you're not just sort of applying for the sake of it and uh, when you get a, an email from them they usually ask for a virtual meeting as you stay in a different country um they would ask for a you know one on one session on zoom or any uh, virtual medium and the interview is nearly about 30 to 45 minutes and it's a very general uh, generalized process like uh, they introduce themselves you introduce yourself um uh, then they might ask uh, questions like you know uh, did you go through my profile and did you see my research interest and is it like really aligning with yours and if yes 
tell me about your research interest do you have any uh, publication of your own or do you have any research background it's very generalized um, and you also may get opportunity to question them like if you have any queries to ask at that time i would say it's always good to ask questions like if you really have any doubts you really need to ask them out like there is no point sh uh, shying away from them if you are really more into like you know what would be your funding and something like that it's okay like you can ask those questions it's just that you have to be uh, really professional enough there's a way of asking such questions so yeah it's just that but yeah you can always clear your doubts like um i understand that you are more into pelvic health uh, related to females but you know i'm more interested in male or something like that so the area same but then the yeah. changes are going to happen right they can modify they might have some equipments you might uh, require for your research that's how i ended up getting my research uh, supervisor <laughs> that's yeah. that's really important and i guess yeah that's that's a really good piece of information you gave out there because mm -hmm. uh, it's there's nowhere written how to you know contact someone or like how to connect with someone and you're right be professional be modest be humble but again be interested so for that if you if you fake it because someone would be like they'll just ask questions for the sake of it trust me the person would know that you're asking questions for the sake of it but if you're genuinely interested if you've genuinely taken the time to go through their research that would make more sense ask questions like what are you looking for in a student if you take them uh might be that specific professor would not take you but that you get an idea that this is what they're looking for and that that's something that you can mention in your you know you're somewhere in your communication you can mention those little points so you're right it's it's a good <laughs> that's really good thank you um so yeah so they get the supervisors and then now what does it happen like you do the application first or you get the supervisor approved first uh i would say if it's uh, your research program always go for finding the supervisor first because the application form itself asks that have you approached any supervisors and have they really showed interest or have they agreed to supervise you if yes mention their name so mm -hmm. they might end up asking like for my application form they did ask me the name and then they confirm it through email like internally there's some kind of uh, other procedure going on and one more thing that even if you get the supervisor it's not guaranteed that the university is going to accept you because getting a supervisor is a different procedure and the academic committee of the um admission process is a different thing um you might end up getting a supervisor but you still may get the rejection from the university because you don't have certain amount of academic achievements or you know the language scores or something like that so it's not always guaranteed but you can say that you just made it 50% like you made it halfway through if yeah. your supervisor is interested that does mean that they take an interest in your profile at least but if yeah. they get a better profile because sometimes they also look at the publications you have made so far because they mm -hmm. need a promising student as well right so yeah, yeah. Right. but if the supervisor agrees that means you have a pretty decent chance but you mm -hmm. still have to wait like it's not official it's not like the supervisor agreed so you'll get in yeah and just one more thing uh, it's not always mandatory to have a publication like i myself didn't have any publication on uh, my uh, name when i applied for it and i was pretty uh, upfront about it i just during my interview i said to the professor that due to the pandemic situation i wasn't able to do any research work or something like that and i don't have any publications on my name but i'm really interested into the Uh, yeah. research part and something and i'll try my best to you know cope up with those losses i already have uh and i made it so yeah sometimes you know not having enough academic achievements or not having publication you might yeah. think before applying that oh i'm not going to make it but trust me like students applying not everyone has those good academic achievements or publications or something like that um and also one important thing your personality does matter like even if you have 10 publications under your name if you are not sounding confident enough uh, you might end up getting rejected so personality plays a huge role as well we talk to the supervisor we then apply we do the application process and then the academic committee sort of gets in touch with you uh, yeah. you mentioned that there is a portal sort of where you can do the applications is it common for oh, yeah. uh yeah so every uh university has a school of graduate studies like 
this is for my university for sure mentioned here but every school uh, every university has their own uh, school of graduate studies or something like that there's a huge committee under which every graduate course falls and they would get in touch with you when you are selected or rejected and one good thing about the universities here is even if you are rejected you get an email that we are rejecting you so that you know you are not in the halfway through like am i getting or am i getting not getting it so yeah rejections are like tough but then it's very clear from their end that we are sorry we are not going to get you here <laughs> yeah yeah they do they'll always get in touch with you for that so mm -hmm. <laughs> okay so now hopefully we got the course uh, and we are in so now we're talking about the course requirements yeah so again repeating myself this is particularly for my uh, university so we were supposed to uh, clear 3.5 credit uh, courses then we were supposed to get it done with the seminar attendance so for my um, personal experience the seminars were virtual for us mm -hmm. uh, because it was pandemic um, and then we have two seminars it is HRS common seminar and another is HRS field-based seminar so under the HRS program, we, as I mentioned in the last video, that we have different specifications, including occupational science, physiotherapy, speech, language pathology and stuff. So every field-based seminar is different and every speaker uh, in that seminar would be giving you very vital information regarding some kind of topic related to it. And uh, one good thing is uh, they give you the pretty recent information. So they are useful some uh, and virtual is like sometimes you end up hearing them sometimes you just put it out on but it's always good to uh, have a look and a glance they also send you the recorded versions after the seminars are over and the common seminars these are the informative sessions uh, which is useful for the all HRS uh, students so it is also pretty informative and usually it's like one hour of session um, and it's yeah, it's pretty informative if you are really paying attention. Otherwise, sometimes you end up zoning out and that's okay. I zoned out <laughs> uh, and there are no exams related to seminar attendance. It's just you are attending or you are not attending. Regarding the course information, uh, I would say always prioritize uh, doing those courses which can help you in your research process. Like uh, for my personal uh, experience I would say I ended up with a supervisor who is more into orthopedics um, but my personal uh, preference was orthopedics and geriatrics because I worked in such a setup back home and I'm still I'm working with the geriatric population so I wanted to do something with that because I'm more comfortable and cool working with those population my supervisor suggested that you take a certain course which which is going to help you understand you know, the geriatric population uh, psychology or something related to geriatric population. And then you also end up taking a certain research-based course. So it's going to give you a foundation. Like, even if you're doing research, it's kind, it's like two kinds of researches, either quantitative or qualitative. And then even if you choose qualitative, there are certain methodologies, which you need to know. Like, if you haven't done research before or if you don't have any research background, uh, doing writing a thesis uh, is going to be difficult for you so for that you need some kind of foundation and some kind of you know knowledge like how you're going to make it through the process of thesis examination so yeah your course um, selection directly affects your thesis part because based on your selection of course and stuff you're gonna make your thesis process very easy uh, like your choosing a topic for your thesis of working on it the whole procedure everything's taught in those courses so yeah everything's very interconnected uh, and you have to be wise enough and futuristic i don't know if it's a word or not but yes. like look ahead yeah uh, have an idea so you can't like you can't just take the courses as you want you'll have to mm -hmm. you have to make sense of it uh, yeah. you're right that and, and again there are certain things that we have not like I did my bachelor's in India. There are certain things that I never really like. We did study biostatistics and stuff, mm -hmm. but the research that we did there is quite different than what expected down here. So yes. uh, yeah, sure. We yeah, you're right. 
take your courses, your credit courses very uh, carefully. Don't choose something just because your friend is taking that. Uh, that would not make sense. So yeah. yeah. Alrighty. And now the details of the course. Yeah, so this again is particular to my university. Sorry for repeating that, but just to make everyone clear that these are the research opportunities which are offered um, uh, in my university. And, you know, research opportunities or the fields of research diversification is always given on the web page of the particular university. For my, it's been aging, cardiopulmonary science, exercise physio physiology, child health, and everything until number 12. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not repeating every every field. There we are. This is the reference that you used. And yes. that's the reference from your university, I'm assuming. So yes, yes. if you're doing research, you'll be referencing a lot of things. So <laughs> thank you, Bunky. That was pretty succinct. And certain points that you have discussed were really nice. And mm -hmm. yeah, any other piece of advice or we all said? Uh, just one thing that the course load is really less in a research-based course. So just don't think that it's going to be too hard for a research student doing research and then also studying. Uh, uh, the academic load is really less when you do the research-based course because uh, it's only just three courses. And on top of that, most of the courses doesn't have exams. They are mostly uh, um, take-home exams or open book exams or certain courses are just assignment-based. Mm, so yeah just make yourself free from that fear that you know it's really tough and I'm not going to be able to do it within the time frame of two years of course you'll be able to do it like I haven't done it myself I'm still in the process but till now it's like it's going well okay. yeah yeah I'm still in the middle of like data collection and stuff uh but like uh yeah you get two years to complete just three courses like i did it in just two semesters that is eight months then you get one like this is a timeline i followed i completed all the course requirements in the first two semesters so i have good amount of foundation and basic for what i want to do then i selected my research topic and then i worked towards it like i made a protocol I applied for the ethics committee and then I started my data collection. So yeah, the academic load is not that much and the research process, you'll eventually learn through the courses you are taking it. So uh, it's going to be a new thing for you when you start, but then you will really enjoy if you are really, uh, you know, interested in doing the master's program. And if not research, there's always an uh, opportunity for a course-based program. So yeah, I would say just go for it if you are confident enough and really want to do master's. Okay, so that was good. Thank you so much, Bansri. Thank you for sharing your details. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be really helpful for those who are applying or even thinking about applying. So thank you. And we are going to do a part three as well. So guys, stay tuned. And yeah, we have a part one. Go through that. This is the second part. And then we'll be coming up with the third part. All right. Till the next time, take care, guys, and then we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.